Today we will start to understand how RFID cards work and how they can be used with Arduino. You will see which cards and readers are available and how they compare. Read cards from a hotel and a trade show and we will also do some experiments to protect your cards from attacks. And maybe we even clone cards? All legal, or at least, sort of. Great to YouTubers, here is the guy with a Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. Radio frequency identification systems, short RFIDs, are convenient. In this video, we will focus on their usage in our projects and how to protect your cards from attacks. In the next video, we will go more in depth, also into hacking and cloning cards. For educational reasons, of course. Only if you know how to hack, you also know how to use. RFID uses a simple principle. It adds information to signals sent out by a ground station. The receiver at this station can demodulate this information from the signal and decide upon. The first usage of such a system was in World War II, where the German fighter pilots when returning to their base airport, executed secret flying patterns which influenced the radar signals. So the controllers at the home airport knew when the signal looked okay, their friends came home. If these typical patterns were lacking or were wrong, they knew that they had to prepare for an attack. This is an example of a passive RFID, where the tag does not actively send out the signal. This was very primitive, but a similar thing is still used in aviation, this time as an active RFID. When your airplane is hit by radar waves, it sends a code back. This code is displayed near your plane on the screen of the controller. Like that, he can distinguish between all the aircrafts in his area. If you once hear Squawk 5621 in a cockpit, you know that this is the code the pilot has to enter into his transponder. But this channel is not a pilot's training. We care about RFID tags and cards. They were invented in the 70s and are widely used since the 80s. And all of them carry codes which can be read by a ground station and can be used to distinguish between friend or foe or about which devices are in a certain area. For our usage, we distinguish between three families of RFID systems. Low frequency or LF, high frequency or HF, and ultra high frequency or UHF. They were invented in precisely that order because only when the cost of higher frequency had come down, the next generation was cheap enough for mass usage. The low frequency devices work on 125 or 134 kHz, which is a very low frequency with a wavelength of 2.4 km. A decent dipole would be 1.2 km or nearly a mile long. Not feasible. So we have to use coils for transmission, similar as used for wireless charging. The reading range therefore is quite small. The high frequency devices work on 13.54 MHz with a wavelength of 22 meters. Also here we cannot use antennas for long distances and also here we only can bridge short ranges. The UHF devices work on the same frequencies as our LoRa devices work. In Europe on 868 and in the US on 915 MHz. The wavelength here is around 30 centimeters which means we can build good antennas also for a longer range. This technology will be covered in a later video. The second legacy is the storage space. The LF devices only can store one code of four bytes. This code is created by the manufacturer and luckily cannot be changed. Or do I know more? The HF devices have a similar unchangeable code called UID plus storage space which can be written from the outside. And here the cacophony starts. There are many different systems on the market which all use the same frequency, but different modulation standards as well as various storage sizes and orders. 
In this video, we will concentrate on the two standards often used by makers. Makers can decide between low-frequency devices, which use the EM4100 standard, and high-frequency devices, which use a MyFair standard. The reader has to correspond to the RFID card or chip used in your project. Some readers can even read both standards. As a hacker, this is, of course, different. You have to adapt to the system you want to hack and have to deal with a much wider variety of standards. If you want to clone a card, you have to deal with two other acronyms, T5577 and Changeable UID. But as said, this is stuff for another video. Clever YouTubers would now remind you to subscribe to the channel and press the alarm button that you are alarmed when the new video is released. But I'm an engineer and never would ask you for something like that. Back to the topic. If you browse the internet, you can buy many different cards and tags. You find nails with RFID chips inside and somebody even prints RFID Legos. If you search for RFID readers, you find the RDM6300 or RDM630 for low frequency and the MFRC522 for high frequency. With our knowledge, we easily can distinguish between the two. The LF readers have a coil and the HF readers a PCB loop antenna. And you know why. So let's have a closer look at the systems. I start with the LF module. I want to see what happens between the reader and the card. To do that, I use an oscilloscope connected to a second loop to make the invisible visible. If you attached the probe directly to the device, it would stop working. I connected the RDM6300 via software serial to an Arduino Uno. We only need the TX pin because we just read the code. As always, you find the link to the software in the description. As soon as I approach the loop, with our measuring loop, we see a continuous signal. An ugly sine wave, with some harmonics. Guys who did not watch my video about wireless systems might want now press the button in the upper right corner to visit these videos first. As usual, we do our analysis in the time and in the frequency domain. The frequency domain shows a clear peak at 125 kHz, as expected. And we see harmonics, a sign of a cheap design without any filters. As soon as we approach the loop with a tag, we see two things. First, the signal becomes smaller because it has to power the passive RFID tag. And second, the spectrum gets wider. The signal is modulated. Our reader can now decode this information and send it to the Arduino. And the Arduino shows the result in the serial monitor. The ID is 2876 Charlie Alpha in hexadecimal or 2651850 in decimal, which is precisely the number printed on the tag. So the system works. But how far does it reach? About 2.5 centimeters for a tag and 4 cm for a card, which is explainable by the bigger antenna of the card. Maybe you read also about scanning your card while you are on public transportation. This is for sure possible, on very short distances, and with higher power and bigger antennas even further. How can you protect you? You can purchase safeguarded wallets or sleeves. I bought some jackets. Let's test them. On low frequency, they have no significant effect. This is understandable because transmission is done by coils and the magnetic field. Is there another way to protect your cards? Yes, I think so. If we put two low frequency cards together, they become unreadable. Because both manipulate the same signal, the receiver cannot distinguish between the two. Simple and effective. Now we try the high frequency cards. We use the well-known MFRC522 reader. You get them very cheap and they communicate via SPI with the Arduino. Pay attention, the pin labeled with SDA is the SS or CS pin. I use the standard library and it works fine. 
The reader does not only detect the UID, but it also prints a lot of additional fields. Most cards sold on AliExpress are MyFair Classic cards, which have, in addition to the UID, one kilo storage area, which can be written by the user. As said before, the UID only can be written by the manufacturer, in principle. The library has lots of examples to start your coding. The user part of the cards I got from China was empty. So I collected two other cards from real use cases one from a hotel and one from a trade show. The one from the hotel seems to have a protected space. Maybe it is used to enhance security. Let's hope. The one from the show is a MyFair Ultralight with only a small memory and no additional content. So also here, the UID is used for identification. Let's check the protective sleeve with these cards. Here, the sleeve works perfectly. I also ordered a few professionally looking cartridges from China. They use the Weigand transmission protocol. This protocol comes in two flavors, as a short W26 and a longer W34. The W26 transports only the first three bytes of the ID. The W34 transports the whole ID. By the way, if you do not get the right UIDs in your serial monitor, maybe you have to exchange the D0 and the D1 pin. Then it should work okay. No other fields are transported by this standard, at least not with the software I used. The reach of these readers is similar to the barebone boards, but they have an LED and a buzzer for feedback and are waterproof. And many of them work on both frequencies at the same time. Unfortunately, even if advertised as dual frequency, this one does only work on HF. So I do not recommend it. This one operates on both frequencies, also works on 5 volts and is cheaper. If you connect the brown wire to ground, you get the W34 format. What about security? A viewer wrote, the letter S in RFID stands for security. Apart from cloning a card, you can also simulate one with a special device. Like that, you could try out all numbers starting with zero. The W26 format has around 16 million numbers you have to try. On average, only 8 millions till you get a hit. So I suggest using the W34 format or a MyFair chip with a password programmed into the user space. Like that, the simulation is much harder. And to extend the time needed for the attack, after 10 wrong attempts, I would create a timeout of a minute or so. What is your use case for RFID cards? Please write a comment. Summarized, the principle of RFID is widely used not only in cards or tags. For your needs, we can choose from three possibilities. Low frequency with coil antennas, usually using the EM4100 standard. High frequency with loop antennas using the MyFair standard. Ultra high frequency with all sorts of antennas. All chips consist of an antenna and a microchip. They are passive and get the energy from the reader. All chips manipulate the signal sent by the reader. The LF and HF cards contain a unique number which is read by the reader. The HF cards also can store user changeable code. Like that, you could, for example, charge a card with information to be used at different readers. There is no organization which guarantees that the UID is unique as with Ethernet or Bluetooth addresses. So you might get two cards with the same number. UIDs were intended as non-changeable. The reach of the readers is only a few centimeters. The range of the HF signal can be reduced by a protective sleeve. This sleeve does not help the LF cards. If you combine two of those, they become much harder to read. Wigand is a protocol which connects the RFID reader with a controller. It transfers the UID in two different formats, W26 and W34. The longer W34 is preferable. There are better systems available like Type 2 tags, which are used in smartphones. I will not cover them as they are not widely used in the maker scene. 
because viewers asked me about UID writable cards. I will play around with those in a future video. And I also bought a Proxmark 3, which is capable of doing many things. As a good citizen, it is valuable to know that such devices exist and what other people could do with them. Stay tuned. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. You find the links in the description. Thank you. Bye.